As you can hear, I've started the recording and um, we will post this later on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can um, you can go to the you go to YouTube and and go and search in their search bar for the Village Green of Cashers, and our channel will come up. And um, feel free once that video is posted to share it with others who think you might be, that you think might be interested. And uh, and also if you want to hear something again or you want to see some of the really cool video that Lori's going to show us, I've had a sneak preview. Um, you'll have the ability to go watch it on demand and. In that video, there will be some what I call show notes that will have resources and links to some of the, re the refer things that Lori references in her program um, this evening. Um, at the bottom of your Zoom, if you've got questions, and I'm here to tell you in my little sneak preview, I had so many questions for Lori that came up um, that I know you're gonna be curious like I was. You can click on that little talk bubble that says chat and just real time, as you think of the question, you can type it in the chat feature and I will curate those questions. And when we get to the Q and A portion of the presentation, I'll pose those questions to Lori to respond to. And it may just happen that in the course of her program that she actually answers the questions that I haven't had a sneak preview to. Um, again, I'll say welcome. I think, you know, we're not, I'm not seeing a whole lot of people waiting in the waiting room, but. I, as they come in, I will be certain to admit them. But um, just wanna say again, word of welcome. My name is Ann Self. I'm the executive director of the Village Green and Cashers. We are the 13 acre privately conserved um, park for the people. We have walking trails and gardens. We have an expansive playground, amazing outdoor public sculpture art. Um, we have three great venues. Um, where we do all kinds of events. Um, and in fact, our next Village Na Nature Series, and Gary, you can correct me if I'm wrong, it's actually will be an in-person program here at the Commons. Um, and so you can see, you know, if you haven't been to the park before, you can see it and you'll be able to visit one of those venues, as well as our brand new indoor amenity. Um, and we're hopeful that we can take the Village Nature Series inside when it gets a little bit cooler and maybe deal with some wintertime topics that would be of interest in terms of you know, the natural features and cultural features of our area to feature. Um, I will mention to you that we are sponsored by the Cedar Creek Club um, through their donor advice fund. We receive uh, a grant from them, but in the show notes, you'll also find a link to where you can, uh, you can donate to Village Nature Series. I'm very excited to share with you, and I'll share this once again with um, to those of you who are joining this evening's presentation, is that we'll be making the honorarium as a gift to the North Carolina Wildlife Resources. And we'll be able to designate it specifically for the Western North Carolina um, region and actually for um, conservation and restoration e um, efforts towards amphibians in our region. So we're mm -hmm. very, I'm very excited about um, about that honorarium and supporting that. Um, we do partner um, on this series of programs and it's been, I think this is our eighth season together, Gary, with right. the Highlands Cashers Land Trust. I know that they, they collaborated with the Village Green long before I joined as executive director. Um, and the, uh, it, what it does very nicely is it captured our uh, three of our shared values, which are um, conservation, stewardship, and education. And with that, I'm going to introduce my peer and colleague from the Highlands Cashers Land Trust to share a little bit about their organization and to introduce tonight's featured speaker. Thanks, Ann. Um, I'm Gary Wine. I'm the executive director for the Highlands Cashers Land Trust. We've been around in one form or another since 1883. Makes us one of the oldest land trusts in the country. Um, if you've been to Highlands, you might know two of our properties, one of which is Satula and the other one is uh, Ravenel Park. Um, and we also curate the parking spot for the shadow of the bear. Um, the Land Trust accomplishes its, its mission through land conservation, land stewardship, education, and good governance. And uh, this, this program and some of our other programs are, are part of the educational efforts, which are really, really, really important for us. And so, um, and I, I would also be um, I didn't tell you that uh, we can serve over 3,700 acres 
in 111 places. We're not as big as some of the other land trusts, but we, we're, we're certainly um, as busy. Um, I have the, the, the pleasure of, of introducing to you our speaker today, who is Lori Williams. Um, uh, Lori is, hails originally from uh, Raleigh, and she wanders out and gets a couple of degrees from um, App State. Turns out she knows English. Um, but <laughs> That then, she, then she saw the light and, and, and realized that maybe she could communicate some stuff to us and, and uh, um, gets a, a degree um, in wildlife science um, and, a, and a master's from Virginia Tech, which is a really good school. Um, I actually mm -hmm. have some of your professors. Uh, um, and at one point, my wife and I actually interviewed for a position there. So, so uh, nice place. Nice, nice job. But she's now based in, in she's based in, in Asheville. And um, her job is to coordinate and conduct mountain region amphibian inventories, monitoring research projects for the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission. Um, and um, she's been doing this for some 22 years. Um, I first met Lori when, when she was working on a smaller salamander, the green salamander. Mm -hmm. It's a whole lot prettier than this guy. <laughs> but, but, but might not make even much of a meal for this one. So mm -hmm. Lori, Tell us about the snot otter. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me try to share my screen here. Just a sec. Ready to. Well, that didn't work. Hang on. Share screen. Okay. It looks like I don't have screen, uh, screen sharing. And you, you do now. I'm sorry. I was okay. admitting some more people into the, but you no should now. Problem. Okay, let me do that one. Okay, let me start the show. Okay, you guys see the title slide? Yes, you guys, you guys see good. that? We're good. Okay, good. All right, we'll just jump in. Um, yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to share your evening with you and, and talk about one of the best animals in the world, uh, in my opinion. And I uh, really appreciate what, um, you know, the, the gesture that you guys are, are putting together for that honorarium. I really appreciate that. And that's gonna go directly to on the ground operations, uh, our field work support, um, and you know, very, very likely uh, directly, you know, benefit our hellbender work. So I really appreciate that. And I thank you for that. Okay, so all about hellbenders. I'm gonna answer all your questions, I hope, and, and um, just tell you everything there is to know about this, this animal, possibly. There's a lot to know. Um, but let's first start with the name. There are so many nicknames for this animal. Um, this is just a few of them that you see here. Thunder lizard and water lizard and hellcat and devil dog, and, and you can read all those. Some of these are regional. Um, Grampus is one that, um, let me find my pointer. Grampus is one that you see in Southwest Virginia um, quite a bit. And here in Western North Carolina, water dog is by far the, the most common name that local folks and folks that have been in the mountains for generations call this species. Um, some more, some newer names have popped up mainly from the scientific community or the, or the media, old lasagna size, is, is, and that refers to the uh, skin folds on the side of the animal. And snot otter, that's another one that's become really popular, especially with kids. They just, they love to say that, I think. But just a, a slew of, of nicknames. Um, uh, one that's kind of confusing, mud puppy, is actually refers to another aquatic salamander that is that name. So we have another pretty large uh, aquatic salamander in the same waterways as hellbender. So it is the mud puppy. This is the hellbender. You can see where some of the confusion lies, but um, just a, a lot of colorful nicknames for this animal. So a little bit more on where the name came from. How did it get the name Hellbender in particular? And it goes way back. Um, it's generally thought of as to be uh, referring to a creature from hell where it's bent on returning. And I don't know about you guys, but that does not look like the face of something that came from such a place. But, um, but the name was first 
uh, seen in print in 1812 by the naturalist Benjamin Smith Barton. And he also in that work referred to the Native American name for this animal, which was Tweeg. I'm not sure if that's Cherokee or uh, you know some other uh, derivation, but but likely. But that's the, the generally the Native American name for it for this animal. Another interpretation of the name Hellbender may refer to as bending movements, what one experiences in the torments of hell. And Barton credits slave communities in Southwest Virginia with that interpretation. The word hell bent actually predates all of this back to you know, the 1700s. Um, and you know, of course, means stubbornly and often recklessly determined or intent to do or achieve something. So all of this uh, you know, language and terminology kind of describe this animal fairly or unfairly, depending on your perspective, but, um, but the name goes way back. So let's talk about the hellbender's cousins. Um, these are its Chinese cousin on the left, the Chinese giant salamander, and the uh, Japanese cousin, the Japanese giant salamander on the right. Both of these guys get huge, uh, especially compared to our hellbender, um, four to six feet long and up to 80 pounds for these animals. But these two and our North American hellbenders make up the members of this family, the cryptobranchidae or the cryptobranchids, we like to call them. And in China and Japan, um, these animals are highly imperiled. They're not doing well at all in the wild, especially in China. Um, majority of the wild populations are, are gone. They farm these animals in China for food and, and other purposes, and they've become really, really good at, at growing them in captivity. Um, so that's kind of the status of the species there. In Japan, um, kind of a different, different philosophy, a different approach. Um, the Japanese have a lot of pride in this animal. They've actually made it a national natural monument, the species itself. They have a whole research institute uh, dedicated to its preservation and, and conservation in the wild. The name for it, for it in Japan is Hanzaki, and they have a Hanzaki Institute, which I would love to see one day um, with just all the research that goes on for this animal. But where it's found in the wild, again, not too many places left, but where it is found, the locals and local villages are really proud of it, and they take a lot of, um, you know, do a lot of work to preserve it and conserve those re remaining populations. Uh, even in some of the poorest villages may have some of these animals left and they take great pride in, in trying to keep them around. So that's really interesting. So a little bit more uh, about kind of the, the background of these animals, these cryptobranchids. This is a very oversimplified um, rendition of, of the fossil record, you might say, but, but the hellbenders here in North America and their cousins in Asia, um, again, the, the family cryptobranchidae, are considered very primitive animals in, in prehistoric salamanders. The first amphibians appeared in the fossil record around 370 million years ago. Reptiles came a little later, uh, around 300 million years ago. And the cryptobranchids in Asia appeared in the fossil record um, about 160 million years ago, about the same time as the first bird appeared in the record. And uh, these giant salamander fossils were found in volcanic deposits in China. There was a land bridge dispersal to North America around 50 to 80 million years ago. So that's kind of the age that we say our North American hellbenders um, you know, are um, in terms of their fossil record. And we call them living fossils because even today their body design and its form and function is a little, little changed um, today from what it was then. They are the earliest known relatives of all living salamanders today. So we would call them basal um, on the evolutionary tree for, for all the other salamanders that radiated from them. So the root of hellbenders in North America, we have two disjunct um, um, subspecies, the Ozark hellbenders here and just this tiny portion um, in the Ozarks and then a disjunct Eastern population here. And then the rest of the Eastern range is through the Appalachians and upper Midwest and up into to New York even. And this is a, a very optimistic range map compared to what it is today. Um, you know, a lot of places have experienced significant declines and just outright loss of the animals. In fact, throughout this range in the Eastern uh, part of uh, the Eastern Hellbenders range, we've experienced 75% or more decline across that range. 
And most of these documented declines and extirpations, you know, just where the animals aren't anymore, um, are happening everywhere, but, but kind of here, here in the Southern Appalachians. We have some of the best of what's remaining uh, for this species. And especially here in Western North Carolina, um, we're probably the number one state that's left. Um, that has streams where this animal can still be found. We have over 140 streams that have had at least one record in the last 20 years. But it's not a, all of a rosy picture here either. We're definitely seeing declines. And even in the last 10 years, we're seeing streams that we used to find at least a couple. We're not finding them anymore. So it's not a great picture anywhere throughout the range of this, this animal. Um, the hellbender here in the Ozarks and then this population of Eastern Hellbender are protected federally now and under the Endangered Species Act. The assessment for the rest of the range was completed in 2018 after about eight or nine years study. And uh, it was concluded that they did not need listing at this time federally. Um, uh, that could change. I've, I've heard that there may be some challenges to that ruling coming down, uh, down the pipe. So stay tuned, uh, the, the federal status could change one day. This is the reason why we have so many good hellbender streams uh, and hellbender populations left. This is um, um, kind of an upper part of a watershed where we have headwater streams flowing down the mountain. This is protected land, our national forest. There's a Blue Ridge Parkway. So this scenario is our saving grace. Uh, we have you know, a, a large bit of a uh, you know, large swath of protected lands high on the mountain where these watersheds begin, all this is protected. That sends a lot of clean water down the mountain uh, in fast flow and good oxygen and what we call high gradient streams that feed the downstream areas where we might find hellbenders and, and a lot of other diversity, uh, freshwater mussels and crayfish and fish as well. But, but because we have so much of our high, high elevation mountains and thus these headwater streams protected, that's really why we have uh, the best tailbender populations left of anywhere. So let's talk about more about the animals and basic life history. Uh, as we mentioned, they are primitive. They're completely aquatic, considered giant salamanders. They do have rudimentary or vestigial lungs, but that's mainly for buoyancy. Um, they're, they're really not breathing through those. They get 90% of their oxygen through their skin. So they're breathing through their skin. Um, it's highly vascularized skin. Um, their, their genus cryptobranchus literally means hidden gills. So it's just aren't functioning in terms of, of you know, breathing function. It's really just for, for buoyancy because these guys, you know, they rest on the bottom of the river. They've got to be able to stay down there. Um, they do breathe through their skin. The skin folds on the side of the body. The, the frills or the ruffles or <laughs> the lasagna sides, however you want to call it. That gives a lot more surface area. So there's a lot more capillary action and, and just a lot more um, respiratory ability with that much surface area. And as larvae uh, or the young animals, hatchlings, they do have external gills. And I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. These guys can, go, can grow pretty big, not as big as their Asian cousins, but still, you know, two feet long or more, three pounds or more, I believe the, the record length for Eastern Hellbender was two and a half feet long. That was a specimen taken in East Tennessee. Here in North Carolina, the largest animals we've seen have been right at two feet. Um, I would love to see one that's two and a half, but we haven't, haven't seen one yet quite that big. They're mainly nocturnal. Um, they do have excellent sensory and light perception with some photosensitive cells on the head and the end of the tail. They have very small eyes, but but don't discount their eyesight. They can actually see uh, probably better than we realize, but really their sense of smell and, and their other senses are, are more developed than their eyesight. They can live a long time, 30 to 50 years um, are the estimates. And it's the same for their Asian cousins, 50 plus years for those guys. It takes a long time for them to mature, six to eight years. So the population is not turning, turning over very quickly. You can imagine if something happens to a few of those key adults in the population, um, it may take a while for that population to rebound just because um, you know, they're so long lived, but they're also slow to mature. They are solitary and territorial. They really do not like each other and uh, just want to be by themselves. A lot of predators um, 
can take hellbenders, especially the young ones, uh, you know, the small animals, the juveniles, everything from trout and bass, uh, water snakes, uh, river otters can take uh, adult hellbenders and make really quick work of them. We've seen evidence of that. Wading birds, things like great blue heron uh, or uh, you know, other wading birds that love amphibians, raccoon snapping turtles, and, and probably others. And they have a very interesting breeding ecology, which is my favorite thing about the animal and something that we're gonna spend a little bit more time on later in the talk. This is what they're mainly eating. It's mainly crayfish, um, you know, benthic macroinvertebrate that crawls under the shelter rocks that the hellbenders are, are using. But they also will, will eat stream bugs, you know, a lot of the same macroinvertebrates that, that trout might need, um, snails, worms, other, other small fish like minnows or, or um, dace, frogs, salamanders, small snakes, uh, hellbenders. They, some populations are cannibalistic. And they're big scavengers of discarded fish bait, or if you clean your, your fish and leave all the entrails in the water, um, or if you leave your fish on a stringer at the edge of the water, hellbender cannot resist trying to scavenge that, that kind of an easy meal. This is what the mouth looks like. Um, they do have very powerful jaws and this, these bony ridges uh, make, which make up their teeth. It's not, they don't have like a, a rooted tooth like with the blood supply like we might uh, you know, think of uh, you know, for ourselves or, or for mammals, but just this bony ridge here, this bony plate that's really, sh that's really sharp. And a little bit wider view of the mouth. These guys have big mouths and they got this fleshy tongue. They feed by vacuum suction of their prey. They don't shoot out like a projectile like other salamanders do. And they're really uh, just limited by what they can fit in this big mouth. Uh, we call that gape limited. So they can actually consume larger items than, than you would think. Some other facts about hellbenders, they are sensitive to pollution because they're breathing through their skin, as we, we've said. Uh, therefore, they're indicators of good water quality in a healthy aquatic ecosystem. We call them bioindicators, or you've heard the cliche, canary in the coal mine. We can learn a lot from where hellbenders are doing well and we can find all age classes and evidence of successful breeding versus where we are losing them quickly. Um, there is, is something is failing in the system uh, where hellbenders can no longer survive and uh, you know, do well um, and be a stable population. So we really need to pay attention to that. Um, um, so they have a, a role to play as bioindicators. They are a bit slimy and hard to handle, and that's probably where their nickname snot otter comes from. They do exude a protective skin secretion uh, on their bodies that's distasteful to predators. It's harmless to us, but it is uh, you know, just something that they, they do when they're stressed or as a defensive mechanism uh, against predation. They are legally protected. Therefore, it is illegal to collect, harm, kill, or harass these animals. And if you have an idea of going to a national forest and turning over large rocks to try to catch one yourself, that's an activity that requires a permit. Um, so that uh, would be a restricted activity for sure. They're listed as state special concern species, uh, which is a legally protected status. Um, a little bit better status than say endangered is or threatened, but it's still on that, you know, that concern list for sure. And a federal species of concern. Uh, and again, I mentioned the federal status assessment was completed recently and they were denied protection federally for now. That, that could change. Some of the negative myths and misconceptions uh, still are out there and they're passed down through the generations, often you know, with, with uh, folks that have grown up here in the mountains, local folks, they hear what their grandfather told them, their father told them so on and, and a lot of these misconceptions are, um, can have real harm on the animal because they may cause people to behave badly when they you know, encounter hellbenders. Um, they may be inclined to hurt them when they see them or kill them. Some of these negative myths are you know, that, that hellbenders are harmful. They're not. Um, they're just, you know, big giant salamander. That's it. They're, they're not harmful at all. Um, they're not venomous, toxic, or poisonous. And that slime layer, again, is harmless for us. It's distasteful to predators, but harmless to us. 
they're not quote eating all the trout. I hear that one a lot, and that is simply not true. They're they're not equipped to run down those large trout and 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 take those. These are you know benthic feeders. They're on the stream bottom. Um, now, in a situation like this, where you put your trout on a stringer and they're immobile or, and or dead, and you get a hungry hellbender nearby, he is gonna try to scavenge those. This is a scavenging situation, not uh, you know, chasing, again, chasing down these large trout to, to, to eat them. This may be where that myth um, got its origin or, or at least got perpetuated because yeah, hellbenders kind of eat trout if they're immobile or on a stringer or they're dead. You know, the, the fish are dead. But this situation um, probably causes a lot of fishermen to, to behave badly with, with hellbenders and, um, you know, could cause them to, to hurt the animal or, or, or try to kill it or just perpetuate that myth. Um, you know, but we stock uh, almost a million trout every year in our waterways and, and hellbenders are certainly not eating all the trout. They're not aggressive, but they will defend themselves like any animal would. Um, and, and these last two, I, I do get sometimes people tell me that they're just simply bad luck and or they are to blame for their bad day of fishing. And, and I would say absolutely not. And I would say that they're good luck. If you see a hellbender, that's a that's a really a, a good sign that you're in a healthy stream system and the water's pretty clean. Let's talk about the habitat. Um, again, picture some of these waterways coming down off the mountain, off high elevation, just good flow, lots of oxygen, good clean water. Um, that's what they like. And they need abundant rock for shelters and for nesting, um, preferably large flat rocks. Uh, and that can include boulders, even bedrock they'll use. And those rocks need to be available to them. And, and by that, I mean, they need to be able either to have a, an opening that they can use and, and get under there, or they could create an opening. Th these rocks just need to not be buried in silt and sediment that you see in some of our polluted waterways. Uh, ideally, you would see this nice um, kind of cobble bed here. And I'm thinking, I circled the hellbender that's kind of hidden uh, among that cobble bed, but, but this is great for juvenile habitat. The, the larvae, the hatchlings, the juveniles, and all their food sources need this kind of structure in a stream. Nice, clean gravel and cobble beds. Again, that's not buried by silt and sediment. This is what a larval hellbender looks like. This guy's about a year and a half old really small and, and he's got these external fluffy gills you can see and, and around age two, two to two and a half he'll absorb those go through metamorphosis and be left with just gill slits on the side. Um, this is a very vulnerable age class mortality is really high a lot of things want to eat them when they're this size you know this is you know inch to two inches two and a half inches long food for a lot of other predators. Um, so for a hellbender to make it through this stage and grow to adulthood is really, really an accomplishment. This is what we want to see in terms of hellbender habitat. This is a great example. Nice forested riparian buffer that helps filter any kind of pollutants that may be washing off the land. Um, also keeping soil where soil is supposed to be, keeping it on the land and not in the waterway. It's clean water. Uh, a lot of rocks of different sizes that, uh, again, are not embedded with, with sediment. There's good space in between, what we call interstitial space, that hellbenders of various sizes as they go through their, their life cycle can use, as well as their food sources. Can't forget about you know, their, their food sources that they use as they grow, which when hellbenders are young, it's heavily uh, relied on you know, stream bugs, aquatic organisms, microorganisms. And as they grow larger, they can consume larger prey. So all of that is connected. It's all related to uh, you know, the availability of habitat and, and water quality. And this is exactly what we want to see, something like this. This is not what we want to see. This is the number one threat to these animals. Um, erosion, sedimentation, siltation, uh, stormwater flow that's, that's unchecked from, say, development projects, road construction, all this, this you know, uh, uh, dark colored water that's carrying a lot of silt and sediment and it's going to fall out somewhere in that waterway and it's going to deposit and it's going to build up over time and it's going to bury everything from you know, the and the, the rock shelters and it's going to affect the entire food web. 
Um, and so it's not, you know, it's, it could be agricultural operations, again, construction, road, road building, development, just poor land use practices, lack of riparian buffer, all these contribute, even steep driveways um, that are, you know, just where erosion happens over and over and over. It's all cumulative effect. It all adds up. Um, you know, and if, if people don't get why, you know, what the big deal is about protecting water for hellbenders, I try to remind people, this is your, this is our drinking water we're talking about as well. You know, this affects us as, as humans as, as well as hellbenders and other aquatic organisms. I don't want to swim in a river that looks like this all the time. I definitely don't want to eat fish that comes out of a river that looks like this all the time. So it's all connected. And I keep hammering that point home that, and, and people get it when you talk about drinking water and, and water for recreation. Other threats for hellbenders, habitat disturbance, people moving rocks. This is a, a big one that we are seeing more and more of, especially in our national forests where recreation is concentrated. And social media is kind of fueling this problem. Uh, people wanna make these elaborate rock stacks and then post their picture on Facebook or they wanna make these dams, um, you know, to make slack water and play here in the pool. Um, uh, the problem is we're not talking about just skipping a, you know, picking up a rock and maybe throwing it as, as a child or skipping a stone with your child. We're talking about moving large quantities of rock and especially these big ones, these big flat ones that used to be nest rocks and aren't anymore or used to have, you know, hellbender habitat and they don't anymore. Or um, we see direct mortality like, like this picture on the left um, when all these large rocks were, were moved and stacked. I bet somebody lifted a large rock and there was a hellbend underneath and they probably dropped it on it or you know something happened who, who knows but this was a direct mortality in an area where this occurred um, so we you know, can kind of conclude that that's probably happened uh, because of that recreational activity so we're trying to get the word out to stop some of these activities especially and on the you know when it's large scale and when the largest rocks are being moved um, other threats, uh, dams and, uh, at lakes and reservoirs, those are just you know, barriers for animal movement and barriers for gene flow and, and really fragment populations and can cause problems. And disease and pathogens is another concern, possibly climate change um, in terms of you know, just more frequent and severe uh, storm and flood events. Uh, or likewise, possibly drought events. It's just kind of an unknown how climate change may affect them as well. But, um, but the big one we're still trying to combat, and it just is really infuriating sometimes, but we're still seeing not only illegal collection of these animals, but illegal, but just the constant persecution of these animals where people, you know, fishermen maybe catch one on a hook and line or catch them trying to eat their fish on a stringer and they harm or kill them when encountered like, like this one. This one was under a bridge and you can see um, a nice spike mark here in the center of the animal where a stake was driven through it. And that's often how we see them killed. And that goes back a long time. I, I hear so many stories of, of folks that have lived here for a long time and, and that's how they used to kill these animals and they used to kill them in large quantities. Um, so that's still going on. It's very disturbing. It's illegal and unethical. And that's some of the, the outreach messaging we're trying to reach people. Um, you know, at the very least, just don't kill the animals. So where are they? In Western North Carolina, the gray is their range. Um, and these are only in streams on the western side of the Continental Divide. So the western side of the escarpment there. Streams in this gray area all eventually drain to Mississippi um, River and the Gulf of Mexico versus all the waterways and streams on the east side of the divide and including some of you guys in Highlands, Cashers, Sapphire, Toxaway. You guys are in the Savannah River drainage and that's part of the Atlantic drain too. So those waterways all eventually drain to the Atlantic Ocean. And hellbenders are only found on one side of the Continental Divide. So this is how what the distribution map looked like before we really started our work in North Carolina. So historically, going back to museum specimens from the late 1800s uh, up through 2006. And this is our map now. Um, so since 2007 to the present, we've been able to fill in a lot of, a lot of gaps in the map of, of more recent records. Doesn't mean these are all stable populations, but it just means that you know, we've either 
found animals there or there are verified reports of animals. So we're, we're filling in the map pretty nicely. Some of the other work we're doing. Um, so, uh, you know, our first priority is, is conduct snorkel surveys for inventory and monitoring purposes, long-term monitoring and inventory of new streams that maybe have hellbenders that we didn't know have them. So we go out and, and take a look for the first time. So those are our inventory surveys. We have a, a rapid assessment tool now called environmental DNA or eDNA, where we can filter uh, a liter of river water through a special paper and send it to the lab. And they can determine if hellbender DNA is present in that water sample. So that would mean that if we got, a, say, a positive hit on a sample, we would know somewhere upstream there's at least one hellbender that's in the range of detection. Um, uh, the eDNA method isn't, isn't foolproof in terms that you know, there is a limit to the distance away from a source of DNA that it can pick up, but we think it's somewhere around half a kilometer, maybe three quarters of a kilometer. So within that range, we can say, yeah, there's probably at least one, one animal up there above us. So that's a, kind of a rapid assessment um, tool that we can use to, to determine presence. We are surveilling for diseases. Chytrid fungus is one that you may have heard is affecting amphibians worldwide. Um, and we're certainly concerned about that here in North Carolina with all of our, all our amphibians and our hellbenders too. We are finding about 27 to 28% of the animals we've uh, tested do have some level of infection, but they're not succumbing to full-blown disease, at least not yet, at least that we've seen. So they're just seem to be living with kind of a subclinical infection. But chytrid is widespread. It's in every waterway uh, or every river drainage, uh, river basin. So it is out there, but it's something we're watching. We're studying habitat use and reproductive and breeding ecology, larval ecology, again, of that very vulnerable age class, the youngsters. We have been trying to study these artificial nesting habitats or these hellbender huts, um, which may look like this. There's another design that uh, looks a little different. And we've had terrible luck with these in North Carolina. Um, uh, other states have had great luck with them, and especially the, the modified design of this. So not quite the same design, but they are just not working in North Carolina for us. Not, not yet, at least. Our streams are just different than other states. Um, but we're still, still experimenting with this as well. Uh, we're also looking at augmenting natural habitat uh, when we do stream restoration projects. If we can get in on the beginning of those and the planning phase, then maybe we can say, hey, add some nice flat boulders here to create more natural, um, you know, large shelter habitat for hellbenders. So we're trying to incorporate that in stream restoration these days. And the big one we're trying to tackle is just what is our population status here in our North Carolina streams and what are those long-term trends looking like? So after, you know, about 15 years of data now that from what we've done and our partners have done, um, and, and I've will mention that this is a very partner-driven um, project with universities and other agencies, um, certainly not the Wildlife Commission doing this alone, but a very partner-driven work. So we're trying to start, start tackling this question of just what is the status in our major waterways and our major river basins? Um, uh, and that's gonna, gonna take a while to, to sort out. Our public outreach is another big part of our conservation work with hellbenders. We started that, um, gosh, probably back in 2007 when we started our survey work was probably the, one of the first newspaper articles that came out. And since then, um, from about 2010 onward, we've added in-person programming with, a, uh, we, put a, we put a live hellbender on display. This is my captive hellbender Rocky, um, captive raised hellbender Rocky on display. We have snotty the snot otter costume mascot that we also uh, have at events and we may show up to breweries that do special events um, oscar blues brewery in brevard was one that that held a special hellbender awareness day and, and a special hellbender beer and celebrated rocky's birthday uh, a couple of years ago and that was a great great event we have signage that we put on streams to uh, alert anglers that you know if you catch a catch a hellbender cut it loose don't hurt it and then tell us about it uh, we have a, a print media such as this ad in our hunting and fishing regulations digest we have digital media outreach as well with social media posts and media releases e-newsletters um, and just lots of you know newspaper articles and, and magazine articles as well um, 
trying to throw the kitchen sink at it really in terms of, of just trying to find ways to reach the public through, through print and digital media. And lately we've added this to our educational campaign, a don't move the rocks campaign, just trying to again, reach recreationists in particular when they're having a good time out in the national forest or, or anywhere really, but especially in the areas that get the most use, just trying to increase awareness about the animal and about their habitat and, and getting people to make that connection. A lot of people don't realize, um, you know, when they're building dams or those rock cairns, those stacks, that they're really disturbing habitat. And, and some people are, are mortified when they figure it out that they're part of the problem and they immediately stop. Um, you know, other people are a little bit harder to convince. You know, we've, we've seen people uh, removing rocks outright from the river to, to, go, to take them home with them, you know, on their vacation. They take bucket after bucket of river rock with them to, to take home with them. And um, so just all of that, we're trying to, to also increase awareness uh, with the public. So not just about the animals and dispelling all those negative myths, but also, you know, what you do and how you play in the river can affect habitat too. And I think uh, word is spreading, um, you know, prior to, so again, around 2007, uh, when we started our work, some of the first newspaper articles came out and, and we slowly started building some more outreach materials and effort around 2010. And, and then we started seeing a little bit of an uptick uh, on the number of reports that people have given us. And, you know, these are citizen scientists, really, uh, is, is what they are. And, and people are sending verified reports, um, photos and, and video clips and, um, and you know, accounts and, and stories of their hellbender encounters. And I love to get all that information. And then something happened a few years ago, and it really started taking off. Um, with 2020 last year being the, the biggest year yet. And that's kind of the trend with outdoor recreation. Everybody just went outside last year. 2020 was just one of those special years. Um, and we, we reaped the benefits of that too, in a lot of ways with just a lot more observations being reported. So um, hopefully 2021 will, will be even, even better. Uh, but, but all these reports that have come in have just helped us put more dots on the map and, and helped us update records for a lot of sites that we may not have time to get to and, and fishermen and recreationists and uh, paddlers and even landowners are out there in these areas and I love to get you know to get correspondence from them that, that you know they've seen a hellbender and they're excited about it so that's great. All right, let's talk about the breeding ecology. This is my favorite thing about this species. It's very unique and very dramatic, I'll say. Um, the breeding season is really short. It starts maybe late August, runs to about mid-September. Uh, and these normally solitary animals go absolutely nuts this time of year. And they congregate around nest rocks. Um, they fight. They beat each other up. The males do the bulk of the work. They have to find a, a nest rock that's suitable, excavate a cavity, and ideally uh, it will be the same rock they've used in previous years. They'll continue to use that same nest rock over and over unless it gets disturbed, unless somebody lifts it and disturbs that, that space around it. Um, but ideally they use the same nest rocks over and over. The male, when he's in breeding mode and defense mode, we call him the den master. And he kind of positions himself at the, the edge of a nest rock like this and just, just you know, wards off any intruding hellbenders that, that want to come in and raid his nest or fertilize the eggs that are in there. We call some of these males that just hang around, satellite males, and they just look for any opportunity to just, uh, you know, just kind of intrude upon that den master and take over. But it's very dramatic to watch. We do a lot of our research and, and work this time of year. Uh, we passively snorkel. We do not touch the animals. We don't disturb them. We don't disturb their habitat. We're just in the water with GoPro cameras and flashlights and, and getting a lot of good information. Um, but the male, you know, like I said, does all the work and that nest rock is special. It's got to have enough cavity space to hold huge egg clutches like this, you know, times two or three. I mean, he could have multiple clutches in there in his nest and, uh, you know, breed with multiple females. For the female's part, once she enters a nest rock and drops her eggs, the male fertilizes them externally, just like fish. 
she's done. She's done for the rest of the, the season. And it's up to the male to, again, to defend that nest through hatching, which can take a couple of months. So he's on guard that whole time. He doesn't eat much. He may eat a few of the eggs, especially if they're inviolable. Um, but he is, is totally defending against uh, intruders coming in that want to raid that nest. Maybe um, she can help us. And let's see, I was hearing some feedback from somebody. But yeah, this time of year is, is fascinating to watch. Um, just all this breeding behavior. And a lot of the animals we see doing these kinds of things, the, the adults can be really beat up. They can have scarred uh, scar tissue and, and old bite marks from other hellbenders, you know, big chunks of their tail missing, sometimes entire limbs and you know, legs and toes missing, which could be predation, but it also could be from, from breeding season behavior. They can even fight to the death. But when we see animals that are kind of beat up like that from obvious breeding season scars, that's a great sign to us that tells us this is a population that is at least attempting to breed. That's fabulous. When we survey a river, we find a couple of adults, maybe off, you know, far, few and far between, and they are just pristine with no scars or wounds from breeding season at all. That's a red flag that that population is probably on the way out, or at least declining, um, that there may not be breeding. And uh, my friend and colleague and collaborator, Dr. Shem Unger at Wingate University, um, spearheaded a study that we published uh, recently where we wanted to, to kind of put GoPro cameras with extended battery life um, on some nest rocks that we knew about and really video some of these unusual behaviors and, and or not unusual, but, but really fascinating behaviors in the breeding season. Um, and we, we did capture some, some pretty rare behaviors that, that we probably wouldn't have seen ordinarily uh, if we had just been snorkeling you know, for an hour or so. And I'm hoping these video clips are gonna come through. I'm gonna play these now. And I hope that uh, you guys can see these. So this is a den master and he's just being a den master male. There's a male coming up to uh, challenge him and, and he is gonna teach him a lesson. This is called bite hold behavior. Um, and that's essentially what it does. He, he's gonna bite and he's gonna hold for a long time. And, and sometimes this can go on for, for quite a while. Uh, but these guys are vicious and they're very mean to each other. But sometimes again, they can fight to the death on occasion. Here's another example of uh, a den master with more bite hold behavior. I hope you guys are able to see these. Uh, this poor hellbender is going to get alligator rolled. Um, they can hold this for a long time. Sometimes, uh, I mean, a very long time. They can just hold on to that intruder and can do some damage. That one got away. These den masters mean business. This is more uh, rare footage, not necessarily having to do with breeding season, but um, these guys shed their skin pretty often, at least uh, the one in captivity that I've been watching for a long time uh, sheds pretty often in the wild. It's really, really rare to see this because the shed, the skin shed may get you know, destroyed or washed downstream, but, but the hellbender wants to eat the shed and it comes off just like a glove. It peels off from the snout to the tail and it's like a transparent glove. And this animal is proceeding to eat that shed as he had some, some advantage to doing that. Um, but we see that in captivity a lot. And that's really cool and very, very rare to see in the wild. This is behavior we call mouth gape behavior, kind of like a big yawn, this den master. Um, Maybe he's trying to increase his oxygen capacity. Maybe he's, you know, after a bout of, of activity or, or who knows, maybe he's just stretching those jaw bones um, after, uh, again, a, another bout of, of activity where he's beat up another hellbender. But that's pretty rare to see in the wild too. Another example of some of the mouth movements, just some of the mouth gaping behavior. Um, maybe he's stretching his jaws, maybe he's realigning something, who knows, maybe he's trying to swallow something, but it's kind of rare to see that too.
this behavior we call just rocking behavior. This is the den master in place, and he's just slowly rocking side to side, uh, just increasing water flow over his skin. Maybe he's trying to he's trying to increase his oxygen intake, or if there are eggs under the rock with him, he could be aerating the nest with his tail, um, and possibly even uh, uh, you know fertilizing eggs. Even if if you know the rocking continues for very long, that, that may be possible too. In captivity, when hellbenders rock in their aquaria or their you know, tank, wherever they're in, that typically means they are not happy and you need to do something to fix the oxygen level. This is some housekeeping at the nest rock. This is the den master um, and he's just kind of working his way back into the under the rock. They love sand under these nest rocks because they can they can maneuver it. They can push it around, they can tend the nest easily with sand. So just a nice sandy substrate is ideal under these nest rocks. So he's crawling in there and he's gonna use that real powerful tail to just do a little bit of tidying up at the entrance. That's really neat to see. A little bit more housekeeping. This den master is using the snout to just push sand away from the entrance a bit, just ever so slightly. And this last video is a longer sequence that um, a colleague at the Forest Service, Kevin Leftwich, filmed a few years ago with, with some of our team uh, in the breeding season work when we were just snorkeling with you know, GoPro cameras and flashlights. And uh, I'll just play this. But in this sequence, there's a large adult hellbender, um, and he is beating up a smaller hellbender. And these guys are pretty oblivious this time of year. They fight and they do their do their thing, um, and they don't care that there's big boots in their way or that Kevin is trying to snorkel around them with the GoPro, trying to film them. Uh, but they are engaged in this extended alligator roll fight, uh, and they can cover some ground. They will end up not where they started. They could totally wash downstream a bit, and this could go on forever. And and the smaller animal could you know could easily perish in this, uh, but he didn't. He got away and he is lucky he did because uh, he was small enough that it's possible that the larger hellbender could have could have killed him and, and tried to even eat him. Uh, again, some of our denser populations are can be cannibalistic on occasion. So wrapping it up a bit, uh, how can you help hellbenders? Um, if you're fishing and you catch one, just cut the line and let it go. Um, some people, when they fish a barbless hook or if the hook is shallowly plugged, they may try to remove that hook, but it can do more damage to the animal than, than not. Uh, if you just cut the line close and just let them go, that, that hook will dissolve on its own eventually. So you know, do no harm uh, when you're fishing in, in hellbender waterways is the first rule. And be good stewards of their uh, habitat when you're recreating. You know, try to uh, avoid building those big rock stacks and those dams or those tube chutes. And if you see other people doing that, maybe have a maybe have a conversation with them and increase their awareness. And maybe they'll stop doing that as well. Love to hear uh, encounters and observations that people have. My email is there. Um, I welcome any and all reports and ask people to send a photo or video clip and, and a GPS coordinate if they can, or at least put a spot on the map or, or give me some sort of landmarks that I can put a spot on the map. Um, you can also call our wildlife helpline in our Raleigh headquarters office to report your observations. And then those folks always give me those reports. You can also call our helpline and other Numbers. If you see people behaving badly with hellbenders, you see people trying to hurt them or collect them or uh, you know do whatever um, is against the against the law with these animals, please report that as well. And I know I'm preaching to the choir with this next one, but supporting local land trusts and nonprofits and NGOs that are working to improve water quality and protect and restore stream habitat that is critical. Um, this is a huge conservation challenge and the Wildlife Resources Commission cannot do it on our own. Uh, we do rely on a lot of partners and collaborators and land trusts are certainly part of that. Um, and, and really the tip of the sword when it comes to a lot of conservation challenges these days. If you are so inclined, you can always reach out to your local, state or federal representatives um, and uh, express your support for better laws to protect water quality and habitat. North Carolina, a state listed species, its habitat is not protected by law. 
Um, and that makes no sense uh, in a lot of ways. The animal may, animal's protected, but its habitat is not. Um, and there are not a, a ton of, of water quality laws in the books either. And those that are on the books, sometimes enforcement is difficult and the penalties and, and fines and fees are, are, are pretty low in a lot of, a lot of cases. So just strengthen our, our regulatory tools in terms of protecting water quality and, and habitat for listed species. That could go a long way. You know, stream from property, keep a forested buffer if you can, and, and try to avoid putting chemicals, pesticides, herbicides on, on your lawn and, and on that property, especially if there's a chance it could leach into groundwater or um, you know, feed directly into streams. And if you were a farmer and have land and agricultural production, there's a lot of funding out there for you uh, to do things like stream bank stabilization, um, provide alternative watering, water sources for livestock, do erosion control. There's a lot of tools and resources out there that, that if you're a farmer and want some help, um, it's available and, and funding is available. And just help spread the word um, about this just unique animal. It's an iconic part of our North Carolina and Appalachian natural history and heritage. And when you're talking to people about hellbenders, you know, make that connection to clean water and healthy stream systems because people get that. If, if they don't embrace this animal particularly, they certainly can get behind the idea of clean drinking water um, and clean water to, to fish and, and recreate in. And I'll also put a plug in for a nine minute documentary if you've not seen it yet, The Last Dragons. You can just Google that and it's free to watch online. Freshwaters Illustrated produced that and filmed it. It's got some of the best underwater footage, uh, video footage that you'll ever see about hellbenders and their habitat. Um, and it was filmed mostly here in Western North Carolina in 2012 and 2013, uh, with a, I think a little bit in East Tennessee, but um, some of us were in that, that documentary as well. And, and it's great. And you will fall in love with a hellbender if, if you watch that documentary, if you haven't seen it yet. And I will end with this collage of, of the color variations that we have seen with hellbenders over the years. And I could throw a lot more on this slide. Um, they're just unique animals and each one is different. Each one has a unique pattern and, and can have very unique colors as well. Um, but that's it. That's all I've got. I really appreciate your time and, and uh, we'll see what kind of kind of questions are in the, the chat. I have a, have a few um, fascinating, fascinating information, Lori. Thank you so much. I just- You're I think, welcome. Do you want me to stop sharing my screen or keep yeah, it you up? Can, you, you can leave. I think it's, we'd, they'd much rather look at the pictures of the cool hellbenders <laughs> than, than see me talking. Um, okay. But I will All remind right. people that um, if you joined and missed the instruction, that if you have questions, uh, to um, to use the little um, talk button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and that's the chat feature. I have a few questions. You can type your question in, and then I'll be I'll be posing and curating these questions for Lori to respond to. Lori, the first question that I, I'm curious to know the answer to this because as you and, and I discussed yesterday, you know, I've talked to a lot of trout fishermen to ask if they've seen hellbenders in their fishing adventures. And I'm dying to see one. So how's the best way to look for them without disturbing their habitat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, certainly some of our better populations, you can see them out in the daytime. Uh, they are you know, ma mainly nocturnal. That's kind of the rule of thumb, but some of our better populations on the national forest, um, you know, Pisgah National Forest, Nanahela National Forest, just go there in the daytime, or if you have a view bucket uh, or a view scope that you can put in the water, if you don't wanna you know, snorkel and, and stick your head in, you may just see them just out and about, you know, walking around. But especially in that breeding season, if you kind of go out and uh, just carefully walk around or just stand on the edge of the stream and, and watch, you may see these animals out and about. That's the time of year that, that they are, you are more likely to see them out. Okay, and a kind of related question. When you showed the map, I know that um, that the western part of the Continental Divide that you know we're not in their region, and you and I talked about that yesterday. But northern Jackson County and northern Macon County are so you know going to the Tuckasegee River. You have I mean, you mentioned that the guy that's behind you mm -hmm. um, came from from the Tuck. 
So that might be a good local place, you know, not too distant um, drive mm -hmm. for, you know, people that are in this area to go and, and look. Sure. Yeah, and that's a popular fishing river and lots of fishing spots there on the Tuckasegee as well. And, and we've had a great response from, from fishermen, you know, that, that see them there routinely. Um, I, I will mention, um, you know, parts of Macon County and the Little Tennessee drainage. Uh, that actually is a drainage that we are seeing the, some of those most severe declines. Um, for, for, there's something going on in Little Tennessee drainage that we are losing the species pretty quickly. And it's not just us that we're, you know, Georgia uh, that have the headwaters of Little Tennessee is experiencing the same thing. Um, we're also, you know, have seen huge declines in freshwater mussels and some of our other aquatic species too. So that's one that we really want to get a handle on. Like I mentioned, the, the population status and trends. We need to figure out what is going on in the Little Tennessee system um, where we are losing hellbenders pretty quickly. Uh, even in the last 10 years, we've seen some severe declines there. Interesting. And I'm curious, you know, why it, this question was posed, is there a reason you know of why they're only found in Gulf drainage? Yeah, I'm sure somebody has looked at that in a master's thesis somewhere or something. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure. Um, you know, the Appalachian Mountains are really, really old. I mean, what, 400, 450 million years old or, or more. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it has to do, it's got to do something with just the way the, the escarpment is, um, yeah. you would think, you know, if there were stream capture, you know, where, you know, on the escarpment, then, uh, you know, maybe you could see or find hellbenders and other Gulf uh, species in Atlantic drains. But, but yeah, we just don't, we just don't find them there unless they've been moved there. Um, uh, or maybe, you know, yeah, we just don't don't really have a good concrete answer, but I bet some some graduate student yeah, probably has say, that in a thesis. It's a, it's, a, it's a great question, and it sounds like yeah. it might be a little light time bedtime reading. Right. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, uh, if there's a geologist out there, uh, somebody <laughs> would probably have a better answer than I would. Well, so um, I do have a couple of other questions and just remind you, if you've got a question, these are fascinating animals. You've got one of the great experts, you know, right here that can respond. So make sure you type your message. But is there, do you, Laurie, is there any data or projections on climate change effects for hellbenders? Or can you extrapolate data, data collected from other species on the impact of climate change? Yeah, uh, yeah I'd say there are very few papers out there that, that kind of address it directly, um, you know, probably more indirectly, folks have looked at stream temperature and, and, and again, you know, the frequency of some of these severe um, and, and consistent and intense storms that, we, that seem to be the norm these days and, and how that may be changing habitat in terms of water quality. Um, so it, yeah, it seems like it may be more indirectly um, impacted by climate change, um, it's just a big unknown. Um, I don't really think we've got a good handle on that at all, but, but just we know from, you know, because we're alive this time right now that, that storms are getting more frequent and they're getting more intense and flooding is happening more frequently. And uh, conversely, probably, you know, drought may be more common too, who knows? But, uh, you know, storm water flow is a big issue, especially in urban areas. Um, um, you know, just wh where does all that water go and what is it bringing with it from the land to the, the stream channel and um, just a lot of impacts like that to continue to, to degrade habitat. But the stream temperature could be something that, that may, um, you know, be something to look at one day too with climate change, but, but a lot unknown. Yeah, well, um, also, you know, kind of related a little bit opposite to that is, do you think that some of the more recent range expansions in North Carolina are due to better sampling the eDNA or better habitats and practices, or maybe a combination of both? Yeah, it could be a combination of both. I think just increased awareness and uh, increased you know, field capacity to get to some of these areas to do surveys, some of these survey tools, like you mentioned, eDNA. Um, yeah, but but the citizen science work with this outreach uh, has been huge. I mean, some of these fishermen are out on private land, especially that we may not have access to, or just some of these more rural uh, areas that we just can't get to or haven't had time to get to. 
So I think, you know, probably animals were always there. We just didn't know where they were exactly. But I feel like we've got a good understanding now, after all these years, of where our best populations are. So that's huge. Um, so that was that's part of the ball game. Uh, and now we just keep adding a few new streams every year, it seems, either with eDNA or, or you know, that one fisherman is way out in this one unknown stream and, and he's got proof that he just caught one. So um, it's all adding up. We're filling in that map very nicely. Um, and then they're misleading because some of those records may just represent one animal that was found, not, a, not necessarily a breeding population. Um, but I hope stream restoration and some of those efforts are paying off. Um, it may take a while to see, to see some of those benefits. Uh, with, you know, water quality and temperature can respond pretty quickly and, and even some of the aquatic life can respond pretty quickly when you improve conditions from, from the invertebrate community, so the stream bugs, you know, to the fish community all the way up. Um, and, you know, and if hellbenders aren't cut off from being able to, to, you know, go to some of these areas that maybe have improved and, and there's enough rock shelters there, then, then yeah, maybe they could expand their population into some of those areas. Uh, but it's, it's going to take a long time to, to kind of see that. Yeah. Well, thank you, Lori, so much. This has been so informative. I'm seeing some great positive comments. We really appreciate this presentation. I mentioned to Lori when we met yesterday that, you know, if you want to blame anybody for this program, you can blame me because a few years, another one of our Village Nature Series programs dealt with trout and and it was the first time that I'd ever heard of a hellbender before. And when it came time to plan this year's um, programming, I brought up to my colleagues at the Land Trust that I really wanted to learn more about the hellbender. And um, colleague Sarah Purcell was, was gracious enough to, to hook us up with Lori. And I just, I've learned so much and I just find them fascinating. I, I'm mm -hmm. gonna go, you know, look in the text sometime just so that mm -hmm. I can see mm -hmm. one. Um, thank you all again for joining us. Uh, just a reminder that this has been recorded and will be posted on the Village Green YouTube channel. We'll also post it on our social media and I'm sure that the Land Trust will be able to share the link as well. That way you can share it with a friend who wasn't able to join this evening or you can rewatch it again, especially some of those cool videos. I really like the one of the hellbenders shedding its skin. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, with that on our YouTube channel, I will include some show notes with some of the resources, including the link to the documentary that, that Lori referenced mm -hmm. in her presentation. So um, everybody can you know, have access to that to, to know as well. Um, I will include information about how you can donate to the Village Nature Series to help us support these educational programming, as I mentioned at the top of the show. We'd like to be able to expand into the, you know, the less temperate months when we can be inside and take advantage of the new audiovisual capabilities in the new commons hall here at the Village Green. And when you donate, you allow us to, um, to pay a nice honorarium to our presenters. And this month, I'm very excited that we will be um, making a contribution um, to this region's amphibian um, conservation and restoration. And thank you, Lori, for providing that information for us. Mm -hmm. I will mention that next month, um, our program, it will be Tuesday, August 31st at 5 p.m. We will be in person um, for the first time in, I guess it'll be almost two years, um, if you count our Village Nature Series season. Uh, and we will be here at the Commons Hall. We will be outside. Um, you will be, you know, welcome to come. You don't need to register. Uh, we will be offering a recorded version of the program, just as we have. We found that that's very popular with the um, with these programs. We may or may not be able to figure out the Zoom option for for August, but five o'clock August thirty first here at the Village Green Commons, which is next to the Cashers Post Office. And the title of next month's program is "Along Came a Spider." And the presenter for that program, Alyssa Fuller, is actually on this um, Zoom presentation this evening. And so we're excited to hear what she has to teach us all about spiders. And, um, and so um, we'll look forward to that. And we'll also be um, sending you know, social media posts. Um, if you don't subscribe to the Village Green e-newsletter, um, you can go to the Village Green website, click on the little envelope icon, and that will get you a copy of our weekly 
um, e-news information that includes future Village Nature Series programs, as well as other programs and activities that we have going on here at the Village Green. And, um, and we'll also be sure to share that with the, with the land trust folks too, so they have an opportunity to share with their e-news subscribers as well. Um, thank you everyone for joining and um, we'll look forward to seeing you all in, in August. And Lori, thanks again so much for this great, great program on Hellbenders. Y'all have you. a great night. Take care. Thanks, Lori. Take care. Thanks, you too.